All right. Welcome back to Failure TV. Uh, today, I am very pleased to have on the show Grant Harvey. He has worked on shows like Orphan Black, X Company, Brother, and Heartland. Uh, he's directed movies like A Christmas Horror Story and Ginger Snaps Back. He has done a ton of corporate work over the years. And if you're Canadian, you've most likely seen one of his Heritage Minutes. Grant, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thanks, man. Happy to be here. Excellent. So why don't you tell people uh, a little bit about your history? Uh, obviously, you're a film director, but I know you've done uh, a lot of work in the TV and film industry. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit of background there? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I, uh, I'm i that sort of typical film nerd that, um, you know, watched uh, Star Wars and Jaws and wanted to, uh, in high school, uh, you know, had Super 8 cameras and wanted to make uh, movies and uh, ended up making a ton of little films in high school that, you know, it was easier for me to do that than write essays and stuff. So I, I, uh, I chose to do that. Um, and, uh, and then went to, um, I was thinking, you know, I had enough of my practical, uh, prairie family in me that I was trying to figure out, cause I was in Calgary, uh, trying to figure out how to break into an industry that I knew nothing about. And there certainly wasn't one in Calgary. So I uh, started thinking that maybe television commercials was how I could break in. So I went to, after high school, I went to uh, university to get a marketing degree first and then figure out the filmmaking side. And uh, that's what, that was the first of my uh, big failures. <laughs> I, uh, I totally flunked out because uh, it was all about math and, and all the things that I wasn't good at. Um, so I funked out and was asked not to return to the UFC. Um, so then I went to SAIT and uh, uh, took a uh, advertising sales course there. So it was a, just sort of a good basic business course and then went into the film program there um, and got, got going on that. Uh, and then when I got out of it, I um, uh, sort of my second failure that sort of has led to where I am was um, the first job I ever had out of film school was being a production assistant on a, a fairly large commercial uh, and the director and the assistant director were from the States and they were total assholes <laughs> and uh, they uh, <clears throat> yeah they ran me ragged and I was like I and it, to the point where I was like they were so ber they berated people so much and were so awful that I was just like I can't do this like I can't work my way up like so uh, after that, I started my own company with some like-minded friends, and uh, and we worked. I worked in a bar at night, and on the daytime, I was a film director, and uh, um, and yeah, and that and we did that for quite a few years, and would you know we're making any money at it, but um, but we're starting to build a reel, uh, doing little corporate videos, uh, little fashion videos, music videos. And then we, sometimes we would take footage from like a music video and then cut it into a commercial and take it to the ad agencies. And uh, eventually that led to getting some commercial work. And that's really where I cut my teeth was uh, doing commercial work in Calgary. Excellent. That's uh, <clears throat> a hell of a story actually, uh, considering <laughs> you got asked not to come back to the UFC. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, that was definitely uh, a mistake. <laughs> I, uh, I was, you know, landing in calculus classes and that kind of thing. And, and uh, it was just, you know, I was like, what the hell am I doing here? So, yeah. And then uh, I think, you know, stayed for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them being, I think, fear. Um, stayed in Calgary and developed uh, a fairly decent business um, doing uh, the corporates and commercial work. And then also developing, uh, we did a really low budget feature called American Beer um, that we shot for like 20,000 uh, bucks. We did a little TV series um, called uh, From the Hip, which was like a, a for high school students. Basically, this was pre-internet. And so it was an, an idea of kind of how to get uh, the voice of uh, the stories of high school students out to other high school students. So we were kind of a, our show was on the CBC and it was kind of a facilitator of, of getting those stories onto, uh, onto TV. So it was like the precursor to YouTube. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and then stayed in Calgary probably for too long. I think part of that was, I was so comfortable with, with my group of uh, friends and coworkers that we had kind of grown up together. We had a little posse and, 
and it just made it feel, you know, it made it very comfortable. It was very creative. Like we could go out and, you know, do things on the weekends and any project, small, large, uh, you know, I had the, I had the team to do it with. Um, and I was, uh, but I know, you know, I had friends that had moved to Toronto or LA and they were, you know, they were urging me to, to make that move. Um, and part of the, part of why I didn't for a long time, I, I moved to Toronto four years ago now. Um, but part of why I wasn't moving was I was just, I had seen people, you know, sort of move to the bigger markets that had very interesting careers going on and were interesting artists. And then once they kind of got on the hamster wheel of episodic television and paying the big bucks to live in Toronto and kind of keep up with the Joneses, they ended up working all the time on a lot of like shitty television shows and, and just kind of like, I felt like they, you know, were maybe losing their way a little bit as, as filmmakers. And, uh, and I, I was a little bit afraid of that. And, um, but then when I, you know, I, I made the move and it's sort of come true. <laughs> it's, uh, I have to work a lot cause it's so expensive here, but, um, but it's certainly been good. And, uh, and I think now I'm kind of, yeah, at a, I'm 52 and I've been at this for almost 30 years. And, uh, I, again, I feel like I'm almost at the beginning of something because I feel like I'm at a crossroads of, do I continue with doing more, you know, episodic television work, directing that, um, where I'm kind of a gun for hire, or w do I figure out a way that I can go back into doing more of my own projects, but to do that, I have to live a little bit more simply and cheaply. Um, or do I find a TV show that I can maybe help run, you know? So yeah, I'm kind of at interesting. It's an interesting career because you, you're, con you're never, there's no set plan. There's no path. You're, you're constantly having to make decisions as to what to do next. It's, uh, Absolutely. It's, yeah, it's just the way it is. And um, I don't think a lot of people know uh, as well, um, being in Canada, the, the TV and film industry up here is, is quite a bit different than it is in, in the U.S., um, despite a lot of U.S. film and TV being shot up here, yeah. they, uh, the, the industries are, are, are quite different and you do have to work quite a bit harder um, to make a name for yourself in Canada. And I have known more than one filmmaker, producer, uh, editor, cameraman that, you know, kept trying to, to do exactly like you were doing, trying to break in and, and get yeah. that foothold in this industry up here. Um, so do you think that like over your career, what do you think it was that kind of kept you going through that, um, fighting through working in, in, in a Canadian industry where, you know, people didn't really see you know, when you look at Canadian film and TV versus U.S. film and TV, people are always like, oh, U.S. film and TV is so big and grandiose. Mm -hmm. um, we do so much awesome work up here. We just don't have the same level of money. And yeah. it causes people, like you said, to end up, you know, moving to Toronto and you, you want to do that kind of work. So, you know, throughout your career, what, what kind of kept you going and getting over those humps? And, you know, I, I don't care about this Canadian film industry. I'm going to make it in this. This is what I want to yeah. do. Yeah. I mean... It's sort of, I, I think I, like I describe it, like being a, a filmmaker, a director and a producer, like it's not, it's not what I do. It's who I am. Like I'm definitely afflicted. <laughs> it's a, it's an, you know, it's, it's ultimately, it's a weird, it's a weird form of art because it's so, the art is so tied in with the, with the um the business part of it like that the, mm -hmm. the you know the sort of money making part of it it's not like you know being a painter or you know even a photographer um it is a form of art that's like that's closely tied in with with uh having to make money because it's such an expensive endeavor um so i didn't really feel like i had a choice like i kind of had to stick with it and that's sort of something that's something i say with to young people like getting into it like there's no easy path and you just have to like, if it's not something that you desperately need to do, you should figure out some other thing to do and do it for fun, you know, like, and do it on the weekends and find a film co-op and make little, you know, make movies and get your rocks off that way. Like, but I just don't know, like, I don't know what else I would do. Um, so, so that kind of kept me going, but yeah, I mean, I gave up my twenties. I lived in my parents' basement until I was, you know, I was married and almost thirty years old before I moved out because I had no money, you know. And and in Calgary, all my friends that were 
you know, lawyers and, and uh, in the oil industry, they were in their 20s. They're all heading to Mexico every, uh, you know, twice a year and driving fancy cars and buying themselves condos. And I was living in my parents' basement. So, you know, there's definitely that uh, element of, you know, I, what kept me going is just, and it still keeps me going, is just this desire to build things and create things, you know. I can't not do it. So, so it's really it's kind of hard to yeah it's hard to explain and and I feel like I almost like when I see young people that are that are desperate and you know and there's a lot of walls in front of people to try and break in like I know people that are desperate to do what I do and and uh, and you know unfortunately eighty percent of them won't and that's like. It, it like breaks my heart, you know, because I know how crushing that is like to, but yeah, you just, I just had to stick with it, you know? And I, I feel like one of my, one of the gifts of that I had and that my friends in this little group had is like, we had a common, um, common love of film and television and a common, uh, very high bar. So even if we were doing a little corporate video, we were always looking to make it, you know, as awesome as it could be. And, uh, and ultimately that sort of ability to sort of know what's shit and what's not shit is kind of what I think, you know, propelled my career is that, you know, I have a high bar and it gets me in trouble sometimes, but it's, it's, it's ultimately, I think why I would hope people hire me. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm kind of the same way uh, with uh, tech stuff as well. Um, I, I am a very creative person and I could not live if I didn't get to do any of the creative stuff that I do get to do from time to time. But yeah. mostly what I do is, is highly technical stuff. And I'm the same kind of way. I'm, uh, I'm very much a perfectionist and I, I kind of get in trouble for that. You know, and like, but yeah. yeah, yes, I know it can can be done this way, but we, we should really be. Doing this yeah, way. no, it's it's <laughs> interesting. Like I've. I've run into that where, especially out in, you know, moving to Toronto and, and some of the shows here, there's a sort of, there's a sort of, uh, you know, and this may get me in a little bit of trouble, but there's sort of a, a Canadian-ness to some of the shows that I've been doing where it's like, it's a little more important that it's pleasant and uh, everyone gets along and, uh, you know, nobody rocks the boat too much. And, and like, to me, it's like, you're paying me big bucks and to like to elevate your show and to try and make it as to squeeze the life out of it, to make it as awesome as it can be. And sometimes that means pushing people. And, uh, and I've, you know, I've kind of heard that, you know, that people think some people think up too demanding and, and, and it's interesting. And then when I do an American show, like that's the stuff they want. They want a director that pushes hard and, uh, you know, you don't have to be a dick, but you, you need to, you know, it's, if you're not aiming here, like for to a high bar, everyone else will just they'll just only go as high as you go. Like you're the you know you're the captain. You you got to take it take it all the way. And uh, so yeah, it's it's interesting. It's a big part of my learning curve doing more and more episodic television. Is you know just sort of how hard to push and where where my responsibility ends. You know that's all. It's all very uh, like I say. <laughs> I'm 52 and I've been at it a long time and it's still new every time there's still, uh, and there's still, uh, still plenty of failures. Um, to, yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, but it's, uh, you know, I can't, I can't do anything else and, and this is who I am. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> you brought up a, a really good point there. Um, like, uh, especially with, uh, like ke keeping that bar high and, and making sure everybody else is uh, trying to reach that bar. Um, I remember once back when I was in TV, um, my roommate at the time was, um, working uh, alongside me. He was my, uh, underling employee. And uh, one day, um, one of the other employees had, had mentioned to him, his, you know, you know, what, why is, Crete's so rough all the time. He's like, you know what? If if you want to get your ass kissed, you can come to me. If you want shit done right and done quick, just go to Craig. <laughs> right. It's yeah. It, it's kind of that way still. Like, yeah. I just want to make the best thing possible. Yeah. And, and trying to do that when you're working with a bunch of people that aren't trying as hard as you can be really frustrating at times. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a it's an interesting, you know, the the art form that I have chosen. I can't do I can't do it without. A bunch of people and trucks and gear and money and uh you know and unions and organizations and it, like it just uh, it, it's a very collaborative thing and i mean that's what that's a big huge part of what i love about it i love 
like one of the biggest thrills for me about what I do is if is taking everyone from the locations PA that's in charge of the cigarette butt buckets to the actors to the cinematographer, taking them all and kind of getting them pointed at a North Star because like it's super magical when everyone is like inspired and working towards like a common North Star, like it's just it's thrilling and that I love that but it's it is a it is a big part of my job to sort of try and inspire people to do that you know because a lot of people it's a job you know it especially I find that in bigger markets when I've worked in you know in Toronto or Los Angeles or some of the bigger markets the the crews are incredible and they're very professional but they're but it is more of an industry like you you have grips that are fourth generation grips and it's a job and they're very good at their jobs, but they're not necessarily filmmakers. Whereas in the smaller markets like Calgary, and that was one of the things, one of the reasons I stayed for so long, like I was saying, is like, no matter, I felt like I was surrounded by filmmakers. Uh, the, the location PA wants to go and make a movie on the weekend. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's some, a little bit more a group of filmmakers that people have chosen their little niche to pro, you know, provide a living for themselves, but they still want to create. Um, and I miss, I do miss that. Uh, sometimes I find here in Toronto and in some of the bigger markets, you do feel like you're, you're in a, a, t a bit of a TV and film factory as opposed to a bunch of filmmakers that are trying to make something cool, you know? Absolutely. Now, ha having been able to work in, in different markets, um, like between the U S and Canada, um, do, do you find that different, um, <clears throat> like in comparison to you, you had mentioned, uh, you know, trying to, to get everybody to, to work together. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more of the niceties and stuff like that. Not really wanting to hurt feelings, but the U S people tend to be a little harder. So um, between the two, like when you're working down in the U S do, do you kind of see a really distinctive line between the two yes. um, in terms yeah. of crews? Yeah, I, I would say culturally it's a little bit different. Um, I haven't done a ton of, I've done a, quite a bit of American work that shoots in Canada. I haven't done a ton of work uh, shooting in the U.S. Um, and and certainly I notice a difference. But you know, with the producers and writers of the American shows, you know, they definitely uh, there's they do they are more demanding with the uh, with everyone in the crew and everyone. And and I kind of dig on that. Like nobody has to be a jerk, but I feel like I feel like what we do is I don't know. This this may this may sound a little bit pretentious, but I kind of feel like what we do like storytelling is uh, it is like part of the dna of being a human you know and it has been since people like crushed berries and painted on rocks you know like it's part of our it's part of what is being human is telling stories and i feel like film and television is in this era the kind of the most sort of um important or popular way that stories are told. So I feel like what we do is kind of sacred and it kind of, it drives me crazy that like I see directors and people that are just kind of mailing it in when I know that there's like, I kind of, I approach, I try to approach every day of work where I feel like I know that there's a bunch of 20 and 30 year olds behind me that would take me into the back alley and, you know, if I can pummel me with a, pillowcase full of oranges for my job, you know, like, uh, so I kind of feel that and I feel like what I'm doing is somewhat sacred. Like it, it is important, you know, like my friend Craig, who's a, an amazing cinematographer, um, Craig Robleski, you know, there would be times we would, we were shooting a show called Heartland in Calgary and there would be times where, you know, it kind of felt like we'd been doing the same thing. It, they'd shot so many episodes and and you kind of feel like, oh, man, I, I feel like we're repeating ourselves or, you know, maybe we should just let the scene go a little bit and move on to. And, and he would all, his thing was like, yeah, but what we do is permanent. Like we if we if we mail it in on this scene, that's permanently that way. And someone 20 years from now will see that permanent bit of mediocrity that we did. So let's keep going, you know, and I feel like that. I don't know. I. Like I say, it's a little pretentious to say, but I actually do feel like what we, you know, what filmmakers are doing is is important and and should be treated as such, you know. As somebody who who is an avid watcher of TV and film, I, I love it that that you do put that much effort in because I am one of those people that can tell when when people are mailing it in. Yeah. Um, 
Another thing that I've noticed, especially over the last decade with the transition from, you know, physical media in, into online is that um, during that big online upward trend, we started seeing a lot more really low quality products coming out mm -hmm. um, uh, in terms. Now, when I say low quality, I'm talking in terms of like you know, overall lighting, camera work, stuff like that. But they had really great stories and that kind of push people through they weren't caring as much about the quality versus the the story and i think that kind of changed everything into where we are now um and kind of pushed people like the netflix and the hulu yeah. to start creating their own content because they were seeing how amazing these people were doing with no money and making awesome content that people actually wanted to watch and they're like how can we how can we bring this to the platform and, and make it better so yeah. now that yeah. <clears throat> you're part of that like have you thought about potentially changing how you do filmmaking to be? I am desperate. To I'm desperate to change how we we do filmmaking. I I've been sort of preaching a revolution for years. Like I feel like I feel like the the process that we have of the way it's done, quote unquote, um, is antiquated like with the gear we with the cameras we have with the lighting equipment we have with you know it, it is we could be doing that like we could be doing making film film and television um more adaptable to the process like the process could be adapted to the size of the project you know but a lot of that has to do with the guilds and unions and minimum hiring and you know like you can't you can't uh, just have a gaffer and and then some lighting tech. You have to have the best boy. You have to have. There's an order of hiring and 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 you know and I and I'm not that I'm shitting on guilds and unions, but there is a, there's a disconnect I think um, and I, and I that's I, I think it's an exciting time what you're talking about where it, it's sort of there's it's become more democratic because if you have a good idea, you can fucking shoot it on your iPhone, you know, and, uh, and get it to the planet <laughs> on YouTube or Google or whatever. So like it, uh, it has become more that sort of programmer idea of three channels and you can just put shit on TV because there's nothing else to watch. Those days are long gone and there's still people holding on to that concept. Like I I'll go on a show and I'm like, Holy cow! You guys are you. You better you know you better squeeze this lemon for the next year or two because it ain't coming back. Like so, I love the idea that because I've always been a somewhat of a maverick. I I was a filmmaker in Calgary. You know, like it's like I said, it's like being a salmon fisherman in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Like it's just, like doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so um, I've always thought about how to do things differently, and I. And part of it's interesting because, you know, your show is called Failure TV. And I feel like the the biggest I feel like the biggest thing holding back awesome storytelling is the fear of failure. Like there's such a corporate structure to the studios and to the networks and to that everyone is more afraid of failing and and ultimately you know being fired or like they're instead of making decisions that are based on what they feel is the right thing to do or will be popular or will make people feel something they're thinking will I, what what should i do that will make the person above me happy you know or or make yeah. make my job secure so there's this fear of failure that that it, like it's just such an industry full of fear and like as you know, like fear is the enemy of creativity. Like you cannot have, you can't have creativity if you're afraid. Like you need to be, I feel like you need to acknowledge fear and, and sort of leap into it. But you can't, if it holds you back, then you can't be creative. Then you're just making decisions based on what you think people will want instead of making decisions on I'm going to make this and I'm pretty sure you're going to like it. And if you don't, that's okay. Cause I like it, you know, like, so yeah, it's an interesting, it's definitely when you when I saw the name of your show was like, was failure TV. I was like, yeah, there's, that's, there's a lot of that. Uh, there's a lot of fear of failure in te television for sure. And it, it yeah. does hold it back. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the fact that, that it, I mean, 
where I'm kind of old school is that I I like things to look not necessarily pretty, but I like I like craftsmanship. Craftsmanship might be that it looks gritty, but I like the idea that that there's some craftsmanship involved. Like I like that that storytelling is being told like by the sound, by the pictures, by the you know, by the uh, the the way the costumes look, by the way, you know, I like that stuff. Um, so I think there's a middle ground where where the craftsmanship, and I think that's what you're seeing now, like because there's so many choices, Netflix and everything else, and Hulu and and you know Apple's getting into it. Uh, you're you're seeing you know you're seeing a high level of craftsmanship, but also authorship. Like people are letting people letting filmmakers on television tell their stories the way they want to tell them. And so it's super exciting. Yeah. Absolutely. That, was, that was a long ramble. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really good one though. <laughs> I don't know what the hell your question was, but, uh, but anyway, that's sort well, of actually uh, going to back to, to what you said there. Um, I can't remember who I was talking to um, probably a good 15, 15 years ago, um, but they were working in the Canadian film industry. And one of the things that, they said, um, we were talking about some movie that had just came out and flopped after they spent so much money on it. And, and we had started talking about um, working in Canada and not having higher budgets and not having, you know, the, that, that same hierarchy has taught people to be more creative and not to fear that failure because, well, you don't have the money to do it anyway. So let's just try it and see what works versus yeah. we have the money. Let's make it happen. This is the way we do it. Here's the formula that we've used every time to make a hit movie. Let's keep with that formula yeah. and, and keep going. But I, I really think that does hinder creativity because I have noticed a lot of very similar formulas and movies and it's just like well, i don't want to watch this but then something like baby driver comes out and it's like why aren't you giving people more money to do what they want and come out yeah. with more baby drivers yeah well it's because of a lot of it is the fear of failure because at that budget level you know a failure is is significant you know that's why i feel like like i think english language canadian film and television you know they I think it's start. It's really made a big change, and, and for the good. But for so long, it was um, it was trying to emulate American programming because it, it, we're at a disadvantage. Like you can turn your TV on, and now especially you throw your computer on or whatever your Apple TV, you can get like access to all this content from the states. So we were trying to in, compete with that, but with like uh, you know an eighth of the money uh, and resources. And I feel like. I feel like now, like there's like, instead of looking at it as an opportunity to be unique, uh, it was like, um, we're at a disadvantage because we don't have the money. And, you know, how do we make, how do we make our show look like, like, you know, the big American shows or whatever. Um, but I feel like two things, like I look at Quebec and I'm just like, so like to me, it's such a, I'm just so happy and proud of the Quebecois filmmakers. Like they're the top, Quebecois filmmakers are the top directors in the world right now, you know? And, um, and, and it's because that culture uh, nurtured those filmmakers and those voices, allowed them to fail, allowed them to make good ones and bad ones, but just nurtured them and supported them. Like, because it's in the French language, people would go to the cinemas to watch their French language stories. So it developed a proper pocket of interesting voices and filmmakers and, 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 and they were allowed to fail. Like in, whereas in, I think in English Canada, like it was sort of, I don't know. It just felt like, you know, we were trying to ape American stuff too much, but that's why I feel like because there's so much service work up here now, there's been a real, like I, I, I defy anyone to, you know, there used to be, I used to hear it all the time, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Oh, that show looks Canadian. Well, that those days are over. Like we've had, we've been trained by, you know, the best as far, because there's so much service work in, in Canada now. Yeah. Our crews, our camera people, our costume <laughs> designers, our production designers, they've been trained on big shows, on, in you know, inventive shows, on cool shows. So I feel like that there's just not that, differentiation anymore like i i feel like and i feel like if anything for the money we put more on the screen so Absolutely. so uh, 
So I, I, I don't know. I feel like it's an important uh, time and, and a kind of an exciting time for Canadian film and television. And, and just, you know, if, if we can check that fear of failure and just kind of like, I look at my friend's show orphan black that I did a couple episodes of, and you know, that was a huge hit. Well, it wasn't a huge hit, but it was a critical hit all over the world. And it, and it had rabid fans that made a lot of noise. And yes. like, it was the show when I remember after the first season, I went down to visit my a LA agents and it was the show in LA. Everybody was talking about the show and no one had seen it. It was that show. It was that show. It was like, Oh yeah, Orphan Black's fantastic, man. I love that show. It's so great. And nobody had seen they'd actually not seen it. But they were it was the show everyone was talking about. And um and you know, and it's because John and Graham and the, the production company, they you know, they pushed hard to make it exceptional. And they knew they didn't have the money to have like super uh you know, big set pieces and that kind of thing. So they spent their money wisely and made it about character and, and, you know, and still, I know John, like not, we can't, that's the thing. Like there's a lot of filmmakers in Canada that just don't, that don't want to just make film little films about people talking, you know, like there's filmmakers like me that grew up on, you know, I want to, you know, on Jaws and Star Wars and horror movies and, you know, and comedies and like, so there is filmmakers that want to have bigger canvases. Um, so I see the frustration there, and, I, and that's why I, like, I think a lot of those filmmakers go end up going to the states. But I think there's ways like Orphan Black where you can actually have a little bit larger canvas and tell bigger stories, but just be smart about how you do it. And and uh, yeah, it's kind of it's it's an interesting time. I think it's pretty exciting. Absolutely, um, and yeah, the <clears throat> like, like you said, the the fans for Orphan Black were just absolutely amazing. Like it was a it was a cult hit uh almost immediately like yeah I, I remember right after it came out i started seeing posts all over social media about yeah. if you have not seen orphan black yet like you need to get yeah. that and yeah uh, it, it it obviously speaks to the level like you can do great things with with smaller things it's just yeah, yeah. the people behind it have to be able to, to to make that happen and i would definitely consider the the wrong team with the wrong budget a, a huge failure because one team could do it for ten thousand. The other team couldn't even get started for ten thousand. Right? Yeah, no, exactly. It's it, it, it is a, and again, it comes down to the the level of the bar. Like I know John and Graham, the showrunners of Orphan Black, have very high bars, and they don't settle. You know, and, uh, and you can feel that in the show. It's interesting that show, uh, like because Tatiana was in almost every scene. Um, it the hours on the show were very long not long no they weren't long like because they didn't have the money so it was always 11 or 12 hour days but the the start time you would start say at eight o'clock in the seven o'clock in the morning on a monday but by friday you were starting at like four or five in the afternoon and going till six in the morning because of her turnaround you know there's a there's a, a rule and it's and it for her it made complete sense to have it so that she could get enough sleep when she finished, she needed 12 hours before the next day. So you keep pushing every day. So it wasn't like, a sh and it was in the winter and cold and, and they, the money wasn't great. But it, I would say 80% of the crew that started the show finished the show five seasons later. Like people would arrange their years so that they could work on that show. And it was because everyone top to bottom felt like they were making something that was important and cool. And, and that's why they would, you know, they would, uh, give up or maybe doing a big American show to come back to Orphan Black. And that, 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 that's, to me, that says a lot. And, and I think the viewer feel, the feel, they feel it. They feel the love for it. Yeah. And, and that's a huge thing. And I think that's um, not even specific to the film industry. That's no. uh, across everything, like, um, uh, like working for a company and the, the employees that you know are like, hardcore they're like yes this is this is the company i want to work for they're doing amazing things and then the other people that are there just for the paycheck and yeah. you can always kind of tell the difference uh, yeah. between Absolutely. the two and it's <laughs> no, <for laughs> obviously sure. you, you get different uh, results for it absolutely yeah i know it's uh yeah it's anyway it's an interesting you know it is an interesting career um i like it's not for the faint of heart that's for sure but uh but it it it's 
equally heartbreaking and incredibly rewarding. Uh, you know, I've, I've had, I've had quite a few projects like probably, Oh man, dozens, I would say, uh, where I got really close. Like I, five years ago, I had a feature that I had been developing for three or four years and sunk a lot of my money into and, you know, put my heart into, had an amazing cast signed up. Everyone was on board. We were financed. And then literally about a month before we were supposed to start a chunk of money fell out uh, because you know, it was a romantic comedy. And, um, at the time, at the time, suddenly there was a glut of romantic low budget romantic comedies came out. So our sales, uh, our sales company bailed and, uh, and you know, and once the momentum started, you can't get it back. Like it's once a when a project goes down, it's pretty. Hard. It's almost better. You better start fresh because it's very difficult to to remount something. Um, and I've had a number of projects at various stages that uh, that it, you know it's uh, yeah, it's tough. Like I've got a little low budget feature that I'm trying to get going for this fall, and and uh, I've, the you know it's based on a book that is written by the author of um, The Shape of Water. And I've got Vincenzo Natale as an executive producer. And I've got a great production company here. And um, and I want to do it for, you know, under 2 million. And it's still, like you'd think with my experience and the pedigree of the project and the producers that are involved, that it would be just a no-brainer. And it's like, I'm not sure we're going to get it put together. Like, it's really, it's an it's really tough. Like, so, yeah, it's... Uh, but uh, but then when you do get something cooking or you do uh, do a scene on set or where, you know, some actor just blows your mind with something they did that you never even considered or you find some beautiful shot where the light just happens just the way it should. And and then you go, oh, I fucking love my job, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, it's uh, it's that. Uh, yeah, it's that thing. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk quickly about some of the parts that you hate about your job. Like, sure. um what would be like uh, in your eyes anyway um over your career what would be the 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 biggest failure point for for you like what, what was the biggest thing that you're just like okay this is done this is over this this is just uh, i'm done with this one I'm, I'm i have to start something new this one's yeah this one's in the bucket <laughs> um i feel like where i have failed uh i like just currently, I think the hardest part of my job is trying to navigate the politics. There's, it's a, you know, it's a business of egos. Um, and I grew up in a town, you know, in Calgary where ego didn't have as much to do with it. It was definitely more about the, the work um, because we all grew up together. Uh, we, you know, you could tell it, you know, you could, we would tell each other to screw off and then go drink a beer later. And, you know, like there's just a sort of lack of politics and, it, and more lack of ego about like your own ego and more ego is to protect the, the project. And I feel like I'm trying, I'm stepping, I'm, you know, I'm a pretty vocal person. I'm a very passionate person and where I've failed, I feel like most recently is, uh, is just not understanding how to play the game. Um, and, you know, I, there's been shows where I've not been asked back, even though I felt like I did a good job, but, you know, I I didn't play the game right. And uh, so just trying to figure out how to, and and then you feel, you can't help but feel like a failure because your work is tied in with your ego. You see what I mean? Like, I can't... I can't separate my self worth from my work. Um, so you, if you don't get invited back, or you, you, you know, or you hear that somebody wasn't happy, um, it's difficult to sort of not shake that failure off. Um, and you'd think that I would start giving less fucks at my age, but it's <laughs> it's like it's hard. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, I feel like that, you know, currently, I don't have a lot of fear of failure. Um, I feel good about that. I just, I still feel the weight of responsibility of, you know, of, of feeding my family. And um, like that would definitely be where the fear of failure kicks in for me is just like, 
I would like to be more free of financial responsibility so that I could be a little bit more choosy. Uh, and that bothers me, but it's also, you know, just being a grown up. So, um, yeah. so yeah, so trying to get to work your way through that other big failures. I mean, like I said earlier, I feel like I stayed probably 10 years too long in Calgary. Um, and that a lot of that was about fear of failure. Um, you know, I definitely, I, I, I know I would be further along in my career had I moved here, but there's everything for a reason too. Like I, there was projects that I did in Calgary that I wouldn't have done and wouldn't have had the chance to do if I had have moved. So, um, so the, you know, I, there's no regrets that way. I just, if anyone was asking me for advice, I would say, you know, use Calgary. Calgary is a great place to develop a voice. Like I feel like prairie filmmakers have a real unique voice. Um, and, but take that voice out to the world sooner and then, and then maybe return, you know, like that's in the, maybe in the cards for me as well. I'd love to bring a project back uh, to Calgary. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of big failure. Yeah, I mean, there's so many, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've had shows fail, like not perform at the box office or not perform, you know, get, uh, not get asked back for a second season. Um, and again, it's a, uh, it's a matter of like, it really does. I, f I find a f that even, you know, when I talk to other filmmakers, like a failure in this business, it, it's really hard not to take it personally. You know, it's really hard not to let it set you back. Um, and, you know, so you have to have support, the support of people you love and that to sort of go, just keep doing it, man. You got to keep going, you know? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, I'm the same way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <clears throat> just got gotta keep going like yeah. it doesn't matter how many times i get knocked down yeah like, yeah um definitely hurt by it and you know my feeling gets hurt and yeah and then you just kind of look at it and go okay sitting here with my feeling hurt isn't doing anything to to get past it it's not assisting me in making anything better so how do i get past this so i can get back to to the way i was and try the next yeah. thing yeah. And I think, like you say, like learning from it, you know, I think um, I, I feel like part of the fear involved in especially episodic television is you are, I find myself thinking about, like if I'm looking at a scene, I find myself thinking about pleasing the producers, pleasing the writer, please, not necessarily about just making the scene what it needs to be and making the scene truthful and making the scene interesting, but more like sort of doubting yourself and thinking, just checking, checking yourself. And, and, you know, just to, I feel like, because when you do fail, you hear about it. You know, if you do do a scene where you covered it in a way that the show, like I've had a show where I didn't get invited back because I shot a scene, I, I, I shot a scene with a point of view that wasn't his point of view when he went to edit, like fix, like, like do his edit of the scene. Um, and he was like, well, why didn't you shoot a bunch more coverage? And I was like, well, cause I directed the scene. I didn't, I'm not a vacuum cleaner. I <laughs> had a point of view and I shot the scene in a, in a way that like, I'm very, I'm cinematic that way. It comes from my commercial work where you, you, you in commercials, you have usually you put up a board, you do storyboards and you, you have it designed, you know, I'm very, I'm a designed type filmmaker. And so I shoot scenes with point of view and, uh, and, and, and that, I, because he couldn't reconstruct the scene the way I shot it, uh, he was really pissed off and I never got invited back. And so I talked to my agent about it and, and she was like, well, well, that's network television. They want you to shoot. They want to have options. They want to shoot it in, in a way so that they can, you know, they can edit it however they want later. And I was just like, well, then I guess I'm not interested in network television. Like, I'm not quite of a script. <laughs> well, it, it's it, because a lot of, I think, network television showrunners, they're writers. They're not necessarily directors. Um, they want to have the choice to put to in the editing suite, put the scene together however they want the scene together. Okay. I, I, because I'm more, you know, I grew up directing. I like the, I, I, I'm turned on by when I see that, like, that's why so many shows you can flip the channels and you could, you don't even like know that you're watching a new show. Like they all look the same. 
Um, like try watching some procedural, uh, you know, law show with the sound down. I promise you, you'll have no clue what's going on. But you could watch Fargo on TV, the series with the sound down, and know exactly what's going on because okay. there's a <laughs> yeah because there's a point of view and there's a it's being directed. Um, you know, it's not just people talking in close-ups. And uh, so uh, that I basically, you know, that failure led me to making a very, uh, you know, a very distinct decision to not pursue American network television. Even though you can get really rich doing it, I, I'm much more interested in the cable shows that where there, maybe there's less money, um, but there your people are being hired because you have a point of view because you you want to bring something cinematic to the show and that's where so i i definitely that's where i've geared my career and that, so that's an example of a failure that i think gave me a lot of clarity afterwards yeah see and and that's what i, I think most people don't necessarily realize about uh, a failure is that um well it seems like a failure at that point you know two days, two weeks, two months from now, that failure could be the greatest thing that has ever happened to you. Yeah. And you just you just don't know it at the time. So try yeah. try, try not to, to dwell on it so much. And yeah. you know, try and try and take what you can away from it and and, and move forward, which yeah. I absolutely think you've <laughs> definitely been able to do. Yeah. I kind of feel like, you know, there's sort of it was it was definitely the universe telling me that uh to you know that I I don't necessarily I'm a pleaser and I don't necessarily and I and I have a strong work ethic and and I like to work but it, to be a little bit more cheesy you know and to find things that and and then ultimately that'll reward you you know even though it's a little bit scary to say I'm not going to pursue the kinds of shows that there's 80 percent of the market is you know and and the most lucrative of all the market. I'm going to pursue stuff that that I find interesting or that like is hiring me because of who I am as opposed to uh, the fact that I'll make my days and not rock the boat and, you know, and come in and hoover up all the all the beats and shots and, and hand it hand it to them and walk away, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. But there. Yeah, that's a that's a that I as far as like an example of a failure turning into, you know, a, a, a bit of a guiding force that would, that would be a good one absolutely um grant thank you so much for for being on the show um before we go um fr from your perspective no matter where somebody is starting from in the in the film industry um in canada u.s paraguay uh wh wherever they are what a, what's a piece of advice that you'd give somebody that's uh trying to start out in this industry and, and trying to make it at this time uh i think um because of the technology available and the price, the low cost of making things now, I feel like, um, I almost feel like things like film school, you know, it, while important uh, or working your way up, you know, like starting as a PA and working your way up through like say AD to lead to directing. I actually feel like the most important thing is almost to do kind of what I did and what, you know, some of my friends did is, uh, is just make shit and make a lot of shit and make a lot of terrible shit, but find your voice. Like, because it's so saturated, the market is so saturated with content. It's, it's unique voices that pop. It's not about how shiny your thing is anymore. It's not about how pretty it is or how big the explosions are. It's like people cr are craving actual storytellers with a voice. And I think that would be my biggest advice and something that I feel like I took maybe too long sort of in crafting and maybe should have gone maybe to art school instead of film school, but just really, uh, yeah, find your voice. Like find, and you, the, re the way you find your voice is by doing, making a lot of shit and, and screwing up lots and figuring out what you like and what you didn't like. But that's, that is ultimately the, the path to success. The old school way of, working your way up through the, you know, through the trenches is, I just think it's, it's going, it, it, it will take you nowhere. You'll make a living, but you, if you actually want to tell stories and be a director, you got to just start doing it. That, that would be my advice. So enjoy living in your parents' basement. 
<laughs> I'm working at a bar. <laughs> st st still great advice, I think. Uh, you know, yeah. fo follow your passion uh, regardless. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've uh, done that myself. And yeah. you know, something that I I really wanted, I decided to to give up on for for a little bit to go do something else that I wanted to do even more. So yeah. uh, I think that's uh, wonderful advice. Uh, again, thank you so much for for being on the show. Um, everybody, we will be back uh, again next month, of course. Uh, great uh, to have you guys watching and listening in. Um, have have a great month, and we'll see you next uh, next month for some more success and failure. <laughs>